This paper is about Aristotle and the United Nations, um, and it's pretty self-explanatory, and it takes me an hour to read, so I'll start. Aristotle and Human Capabilities, the synthesis of ancient, modern, and postmodern paradigms in the era of globalization. This paper describes a fruitful way of synthesizing Aristotle's theory of the virtues and practical wisdom with the capabilities approach to international economic and political development, a model used by the United Nations to evaluate the justice or injustice of today's nation states. Specifically, I'm using the version of capabilities set out by Dr. Martha Nussbaum in her book, Women and Human Development. Nussbaum is a prominent Aristotle scholar. She understands the relevance of Aristotle's views in our era of globalization. Nussbaum argues that a neo-Aristotelian approach to development is better than the theoretical constructs formulated during the Enlightenment. She addresses current Kantian and neo-Kantian, utilitarian and neo-utilitarian, Marxist and neo-Marxist models, as well as more recent Rawlsian and neo-Rawlsian positions. I will claim that Aristotle's model of practical wisdom and all of the virtues it is based on is not only compatible with the, with the capabilities approach, but that they are mutually interdependent. In order for the capabilities approach to have any influence on international development, those with the power to implement it must be willing and able to do so in a way that achieves these goals. Aristotle's ethics and politics provides a model of how the citizens of any nation, particularly those who inherit power and privilege, must be raised so that they will be willing and able to use their power wisely. Those who are raised well and who exercise practical wisdom as adults would agree with the capabilities model or some modification of it as a good starting point from which to make particular judgments. Nussbaum develops her version of the capabilities model in 1986 when she was working with Amarta Zen at the World Institute for Development Economics Research because, she says, quote, we recognize that ideas I had been pursuing in the context of Aristotle's scholarship had a striking resemblance to ideas that he had for some years been pursuing in economics, unquote. Since, since then, Zen won a Nobel Prize in economics for his formulation and application of this model to global economic development projects. Nussbaum's list of central human functional capabilities can be summarized as follows. Life, being able to live to the end of a human life of normal length, not dying prematurely or before one's life is so reduced as to be not worth living. Thing. Two, bodily health, being able to have good health, including reproductive health, to be adequately nourished, to have adequate shelter. Three, bodily integrity, being able to move freely from place to place, having one's bodily boundaries treated as sovereign. Being able to be secure against assault, including sexual assault, child abuse, and domestic violence having opportunities for sexual satisfaction and for choice in matter of reproduction. Fourth, senses and imagination and thought, being able to use the senses to imagine, think, and reason, and to do these things in a truly human way, a way informed and cultivated by an adequate education, being able to use one's mind in ways protected by guarantees of freedom of expression, with respect to both political and artistic speech and freedom of religious exercise, being able to have pleasurable experiences and to avoid non-necessary pain. Fifth, emotions, being able to have attachments to things and people outside ourselves, to love those who love and care for us, to grieve at their absence, not having one's emotional development blighted by overwhelming fear and anxiety or by traumatic events of abuse or neglect. Six, practical reason, being able to form a conception of the good 
and to engage in critical reflection about the planning of one's life. Seventh, affiliation, being able to recognize and show concern for other human beings, having the capabilities for both justice and friendship, having the social basis of self-respect and non-humiliation, protections against discrimination on the basis of race, sex, sexual orientation, religion, caste, ethnicity, or national origin, in work, being able to work as a human being. Eighth, other species, being able to live with concern for and in relation to animals, plants, and the world of nature. Ninth, play, being able to laugh, to play, and to enjoy recreational activities. Ten, control over one's environment. First, political, being able to participate effectively in political choices that govern one's life, having the right of political participation, free speech, and association. Also, material, being able to hold property and have real opportunity, having property rights on an equal basis with others, having the right to seek employment on an equal basis with others, having the freedom from unwarranted search and seizure. Although Nussbaum does not mention this, the capabilities approach is compatible with a postmodern school of thinking which calls itself the systems approach and has been described by, among others, Irvin Laszlo in his book, The System's View of the World. This view rejects enlightenment models of the universe and of human nature altogether and replaces them with a view consistent with current discoveries in physics, biology, and the social sciences. Nussbaum's way of incorporating what is worth preserving from Aristotle and modern thinkers, Laszlo's comprehensive explanation of the principles of systems theory, and my own work together lead to a synthesis of ancient, modern, and postmodern thought. If developed completely, this view would take what is best from each model and create a more comprehensive and accurate view of nature, human nature, what we now know, and we, what we must do to create a sustainable future for ourselves and those who come after us. The vision of a world run by persons of practical wisdom. Aristotle's model of practical wisdom is a description of a person who possesses and actively exercises all of the moral virtues and most of the intellectual virtues and has been doing so for many years. Persons of practical wisdom were given the opportunity to exercise all of their capabilities because, in order to attain practical wisdom, they are actually exercising those capabilities at their highest level. The way Aristotle describes the highest achievement of statecraft is perfectly compatible with the way a ruler following the capabilities approach would actually use his or her power. The true art of statecraft for Aristotle is the art of creating and sustaining a strong middle class. This requires the continual weaving together of the rich and poor not allowing either, either one to gain too much power and exercise it at the expense of the other. A ruler who seeks to develop the capabilities of as many citizens as possible is also creating a strong middle class, even though the United Nations model does not explicitly say this. The goal of globalization and the art of statecraft are the same, creating a community of middle class citizens dedicated to developing themselves in each other in ways that promote goodwill between citizens and between nations. Neither model judges a nation as just or unjust according to the structure of the laws or political institutions. A society with elected officials is not necessarily just, and a society with an absolute monarch is not necessarily unjust on either model. Rather, on both models, a society is just or unjust based on whether the rulers exercise their power justly, that is, for the common good. Aristotle divides forms of government into six types. Monarchy and tyranny are both the rule of one person. A monarchy exists when the ruler is just. A tyranny exists when the ruler is unjust, which means rules for the sake of himself. 
Aristocracy and oligarchy are both the rule of a small number of people. Aristocracy exists when the rulers rule for the sake of the ruled, and they're just. Oligarchy exists when the rulers have power only because they are rich and use their power to stay rich. Democracy is the rule of the many. When nations with democratic constitutions are just, the people are also virtuous and just, and the rulers act for the sake of the common good. When a nation with such a constitution is unjust, the people are unjust and elect rulers who give them whatever they desire when what they want is not in the interest of the nation as a whole and of its future. If the conditions make it possible, Aristotle argues that every just ruler should move his or her society in the direction of a polity, a mix of democracy and aristocracy. Such a constitution gives the people the opportunity to make decisions on public policy in some cases and gives elected or appointed officials the power to make final decisions in other cases. The Constitution recognizes that some people are better at making decisions about practical affairs than others. The decisions that require the most subtle reasoning or, inf or information or diplomatic skills need to be made by someone who can do those tasks well. The Constitution also recognizes that giving the people a chance to vote will encourage them to develop a public conscience a desire and ability to understand political life and the responsibilities that come with this level of association. Aristotle also recognizes that not every nation at a given time has a stability or history necessary to have this kind of constitution, but it should always be aiming for that in that direction. Aristotle knew that it takes a very morally upright, intelligent, educated, and experienced person to know how to exercise the art of statecraft. Not everyone can exercise authority without being corrupted by it, or weigh all the factors when considering political decisions. Not everyone can look at situations objectively, seeing themselves as equal citizens under the law and making laws that everyone must obey. Not everyone can create laws that lead to the best possible political association in a particular nation at a particular time. Not everyone can listen to conflicting points of view and come up with a resolution that is truly in the interest of everyone or can distinguish between what is best in theory and what is best in a particular situation. Not everyone can aim for what is attainable and hit the goal. Not everyone can figure out how to get conflicting factions to negotiate and come up with a compromise and stick to their agreements. Aristotle assumes that people are unequal in their ability to rule well and that a state that wants to be well run generation after generation should be organized in a way that will increase the likelihood of finding and nurturing those young people who have the most potential to lead. Although Aristotle is often accused of being elitist and anti-democratic, when he's looked at more closely, the art of statecraft includes giving everyone a chance to participate in civic life. It encourages and even requires people to develop an awareness of their lives as citizens who live with people they don't know under a common body of laws. He wants people to be as informed as they have the time and ability to be. He simply recognizes that not everyone can make good judgments at, about how to best promote the ideal of maximizing the capabilities of citizens. When Aristotle advocates identifying those who are more quote-unquote noble and teaching them to limit their desires so that they will eventually take over and be able to handle their power, and when he advocates identifying the ignoble and finding ways, including making laws, to prevent them from being able to accumulate excess wealth or power, he's not being an elitist. The so-called ignoble are not the poor or uneducated per se. They are more likely to be rich, powerful, and well-educated, which is why they have to be kept from the real possibility that they could take over a nation and drive it in the wrong direction. This is not elitism. It is realism. 
When Aristotle worries about demagogues who manipulate the emotions and resentments of the masses inciting a revolution, he's not defending an entrenched wealthy class. Rather, he recognizes how the ambition of a demagogue can lead to the manipulation of the less educated and poor and a political regime change to their disadvantage. Unfortunately, the resulting instability usually only does the entire society harm in the end, especially the poor. Aristotle discourages political instability and tries instead to reason with his readers. He tries to show those who are reading and reflecting on his works that it is in their interest to rule justly, to rule for the sake of the ruled, in order to preserve their own power and privilege and to provide the highest quality of life for everyone. Aristotle's examination of the various city-states in Greece at his time is an insightful model for the kind of analysis students of politics should be engaged in today in the study of nations throughout the world. In each case, students should learn about how the laws, customs, and habits of a people either promote or discourage the formation of a strong middle class of self-controlled, self-governing, -govern self-sufficient individuals. Aristotle refuses to be ideological. He argues for a universal standard of justice, but a different kind of universal. Justice does not exist primarily in one set of laws or one constitution, or in an ideology. It exists primarily in the souls of citizens. Statecraft is the art of creating and sustaining justice in the souls of citizens. Since the power of justice in the soul cannot be exercised without relating to fellow citizens justly, the cultivation of the individual soul is inseparable from the cultivation of a high quality of social and political life. Aristotle also does a nice job of distinguishing between the virtue of a citizen and the virtue of a human being as such. Certainly he recognizes that most cities are not entirely just. Many people have been asked to do things as citizens which are not by nature just. A city might be based on a way of life that is not truly just. Sparta, for example, according to Aristotle, is organized around the belief that political unity and stability are the highest goal toward which all social and political life should aim. To be a good Spartan, then, is not the same as being a good person. In a just city, those who possess the most practical wisdom are given the most power and respect and are honored as the best citizens. Aristotle is correct to claim that the only criteria for being given wealth and power should be the habitual exercise of the virtues, particularly the virtue of practical wisdom. Even though a good ruler is a great gift to a city because he or she will make good decisions in all the particular cases that come up every day, Aristotle is correct when he argues that the rule of law should prevail over the arbitrary rule of individual people. The law is dispassionate, universal, and longer lasting than the judgments of individuals. Even with a standing body of good laws, those who interpret the laws in a given case or apply the laws can do so well or poorly. Corruption enters the system at any point. A good ruler will both make laws that aim to preserve a middle class and are enforceable and will take very seriously the educational system so that citizens will be emotionally trained to want to get along and help each other beyond what the law requires. Cultivating a culture in which citizens have goodwill toward each other is more important than a set of laws that look good on paper. Culture is about human relationships, not about disembodied laws. How can these models be applied to nation states today? To cite one example, someone applying either Aristotle or the capabilities model would accept the system of inherited power in the country of Jordan because the ruling family has shown itself to be dedicated to the rule of law and the development of the capabilities of the citizens. If an election occurred, it is most likely that a much more authoritarian ruler would be elected who would not follow the capabilities approach, 
women in particular would be denied many opportunities to develop their capabilities. Aristotle and the United Nations would agree that some constitutions are more conducive to developing the capabilities of the citizens and hence creating a large and stable middle class. But they would both hold the rulers accountable for the way they interpret and apply their laws and what they do with the power given to them by their constitutions. In nations that are torn by tribal animosities, such as some African nations, for example, it is difficult to know if a given ruler is exercising his power in what appears to Westerners to be an excessively authoritarian way, or if the alternatives would be even worse. Aristotle emphasizes the importance of mutual trust and goodwill between citizens. He recognizes that this basic trust is more important than good laws because when citizens do not trust each other, laws have no effect on behavior. In cases where the law of the jungle, kill or be killed, is the unwritten rule of the land, the only possible solution is to bring in the UN peacekeeping force to try and impose international law. To a nation in a state of political anarchy, Aristotle's model of a polity and of practical wisdom seems hopelessly theoretical and unattainable. Yet in many ways, Aristotle's categories provide insight into how to analyze what's happening and figure out what is possible at a given place and time. The United Nations and the European Union provide funding to develop nations so they can bring in non-governmental organizations and other types of organizations of civil society that bind people together as human beings with the same capabilities and desire to develop those capabilities. Such organizations provide alternatives to the bonding that goes on when people meet together only as members of warring tribes or as members of warring religious sects or as members of particular families. On the capabilities model, the purpose of the organization is to develop the capabilities of members of the underclass. Aristotle's view takes the process a step farther. Those who run the organizations have had the opportunity to develop themselves and are now actively engaged in acts of generosity, genuine friendship, and social, economic, and political justice as Aristotle defines them. Those who run the organizations are exercising the virtues and practical wisdom when they use the power they have to rule for the sake of the ruled and do so in a way that reflects insight into the particular context, the individuals involved, the cultural context, the historical context, etc. In order to achieve the goal of a nation that moves toward a larger and more stable middle class, rulers must possess the Aristotelian virtues, and they must include the cultivation of those virtues in the people who are being given the opportunity to develop their capabilities. Kantians and utilitarians set up models for ruling that focus on teaching leaders to detach themselves from their emotions and consider only the facts or only the universal rational principle at stake. Aristotle would say this is both impossible and undesirable. A good ruler has got grown up performing virtuous and just actions so that as an adult he or she can do what is best in an immediate and critical situation. The United Nations and the Capabilities Model try to avoid the need for character development because it often leads to disagreements about values. In the modern world, facts have supposedly been separated from values. Science concerns itself with facts and religion and philosophy with values. Religion has often been the source of conflict among people and divides people along tribal, racial, and ethnic lines. The United Nations wants a so-called objective standard for determining justice and injustice and wants to transcend claims about good and evil. Aristotle's model provides a set of categories based on human nature which is generic enough to include the basic values promoted by every major world religion and by humanistic philosophies. 
Globalization will not move forward in a way that leads to nations with a stable middle class unless these basic virtues are cultivated in citizens in all areas of private and public life. Aristotle's Theory of Virtues The list of Aristotelian virtues is long, so I cannot discuss all of them thoroughly here. Some of them are more important than others for creating societies that develop the capabilities of their citizens. I will describe only three of them, those that are most immediate and least controversial. Then I will show how we can come to universal agreement on the need to cultivate these virtues and avoid the vices connected with them in order to create a just and sustainable future for our world. To put the particular virtues in perspective, Aristotle believes that human beings are born neither good nor evil, but become so according to what they do. Quote, neither by nature then nor contrary to nature do excellences arise in us. Rather, we are adapted by nature to receive them and are made perfect by habit. We become just by doing just acts, temperate by doing temperate acts, brave by doing brave acts, unquote. In some sense, then, Aristotle would agree that we become virtuous or vicious according to how we're socially conditioned. However, this does not imply that all morality is simply the result of cultural conditioning. Some ways of being conditioned are better than others. Although this sounds ethnocentric, Upon closer examination, it can be shown to be universally acceptable. The key indicator of a person of practical wisdom is that he or she takes pleasure in doing good and just actions and seeks a way of life that will provide the opportunity to engage in as many such actions as possible. Quote, for pleasure is a state of soul. Just actions are pleasant to the lover of justice. For most men, their pleasures are in conflict with one another because they are not by nature pleasant. But the lovers of what is noble find pleasant the things that are by nature pleasant, and excellent actions are such. I will, dis unquote. I will discuss three of Aristotle's virtues, temperance, courage, liberality or generosity, and their corresponding vices. They are related to the most basic human drives so everyone can identify with what Aristotle says. Everyone's life and society are profoundly affected by each individual's exercise of the particular virtue or vice involved. I will begin with Aristotle's definitions of these virtues and their related vices. Then I will formulate a model of what a society of adults who exercise these virtues would be like. Next, I will describe the many ways societies can fall apart from the failure to exercise these virtues and the exercise of the vices instead. Finally, I will compare these models to general claims about world politics and globalization today. And I think because of time, I won't quote Aristotle so much. I'll just quote my descriptions. Aristotle defines temperance as the mean between the extremes of too much or too little in relation to the basic pleasures of eating, drinking, and sex. The, the temperate person will desire moderately and as he should. A temperate person would tend to be healthy and experience the pleasure that comes from eating and drinking moderately. An intemperate person would experience more pain due to sickness, obesity, and other health problems that result from intemperate behavior. The most rational person chooses the mean between extremes. Even though people and nations disagree at times on how much exactly is too much to drink, everyone can agree that there's a difference between temperance and intemperance in relationship to, to drinking. Every society also has limitations on sexual activity, although what those limits are also varies. It's possible, however, to pursue sexual pleasure in ways that are ignoble, and every human being will agree to some limits in this case. In the case of temperance, people are much more likely to err on the side of too much rather than too little. Aristotle argues that greed, the desire for more than one share, is the greatest political evil. This drive creates animosity between rich and poor, leading to crime, war, 
unjust laws, uh, the undermining of law and stability, and the general loss of cultivation of the natural powers of the souls of every citizen. Aristotle, agreeing with Marx, would be very critical of laissez-faire capitalism. He would agree that a nation should give its economic leaders the most possible freedom to create more and more wealth. He would not agree. A nation does not exist for the sake of wealth. Wealth is rather a means to the end of the flourishing of the citizens. Focusing on creating wealth without focusing on the distribution of wealth will only lead to internal instability and animosity. In his discussion of the household, Aristotle distinguishes between natural acquisition, the need to make a living and get one's needs met, and unnatural acquisition, the desire for more than one needs. Children should not grow up in households that have either too much or too little. When they grow up with too much wealth and privilege, they develop false pride and think they deserve to be rich and powerful when they've not demonstrated the capacity to rule well. When they grow up too poor, children do not develop their natural capability to deliberate about public affairs and to perform acts of justice in relation to their fellow citizens. Leisure time is important for cultivating the higher order capabilities. The virtue of generosity, giving away money to fellow citizens, is an economic way of recognizing that we all need each other. Our quality of life depends on improving the quality of other people's lives. In order to exercise this virtue, households need to have more than the bare necessities. When applying Aristotle's model today, we may ask, how many children today are being raised to desire and eventually seek out opportunities to exercise virtue and justice in the pursuit of truth? How many are desperately poor? How many grow up in households that waste resources and pander to unnecessary desires without thinking about it through long-established habits? How many children grow up assuming the world owes them the gratification of their unnecessary desires? How many children grow up in households where the incomes are moderate, but parents want more and more, and raise their children to want and to get more than they need as the primary indication of a successful life? Aristotle's view, particularly since it is based on a naturalistic systems world view of the natural world and recognizes the need to integrate culture with nature, is extremely relevant and important in our age. Aristotle defines courage as the virtue in relation to situations involving fear. The most obvious is the fear of death, especially an untimely death, which most often occurs in war. Other kinds of fear are the fear of physical pain and disease, the fear of failure, loss of reputation due to a job loss, or expressing an unpopular opinion in public. Aristotle says of the brave person, he will fear even the things that are not beyond human strength. He will fear them as he ought and has reason directs, and he will face them for the sake of what is noble, for this is the end of excellence. The extremes are being rash or taking unnecessary risks and being cowardly or avoiding risks that ought to be faced. Aristotle understood the importance of a military sector of society as the way to preserve national security. He knew that people had to bind together into a unity and listen to the voice of authority when a nation is under attack. Soldiers have to obey without question. The military sector is often corrupted, however, if it is under the control of those who are motivated to accumulate power or wealth. In such cases, unjust wars will be fought for the sake of power or wealth. The military can also be corrupted when it's under the control of those whose idea of the highest good is uncritical obedience to rulers and the desire for personal glory in battle. In these cases, unjust wars will be fought for the sake of power and glory. The goal of political association is to develop the souls of citizens through the cultivation of talents and the existence of many kinds of of relationships and organizations that enable people to develop their souls. As many citizens as possible should have the opportunity to exercise some degree of authority 
in the political sector and in other sectors of social life. Wealth and war are only means to the true end of human life. When their pursuit is ends, capabilities of most people are not developed. Individuals and nations disagree on how to apply this standard. Some believe everyone ought to spend some time in the military to show they have the courage to face risk for the sake of national security. Some believe the greatest act of courage is to die for your country. Others think it's a great act of courage to risk imprisonment for speaking out against your country when you think it is engaged in non unnecessary expansionist wars. Some advocate nonviolent civil disobedience, a public display of breaking what one believes are unjust laws, along with accepting the punishment in order to raise public consciousness to have the laws changed. Some advocate violent resistance to the extreme of civil war. Some advocate asylum in another country. Each side accuses the other of cowardice or rashness. The only answer to such dilemmas is to reflect, argue, find analogies in history, develop a position, act on it, and give your reason. The ability to do this well depends on natural intelligence, the desire for justice, access to education and information, and a willingness to debate publicly with the best minds on all sides. Aristotle defines liberality as the virtue in relation to giving away money. Those do, who do not have a lot of money but give what they have are liberal. Those who have a great deal of money and give it away wisely are magnanimous. The extremes are stinginess, giving too little, <coughs> or extravagance, giving too much. This virtue is critical for Aristotle. Greed is what feeds the war between the rich and the poor and creates instability. Um, let's see. When the desire is focused on gaining wealth, the nation's resources are squandered among the wealthy few who raise their children to be indifferent, um, on and on. Okay. Again, however, people disagree in particular cases. The elite in some societies claim that in their nations at that time it would be impossible to distribute wealth equitably because the poorer class is too large. To even begin to redistribute wealth would lead the poor to believe they deserve more. They would begin a revolution which, which would harm everyone, especially the poor. The standard argument is that stability is better than change. Such a theory might seem obvious or it could be ignored or rejected as either too idealistic or else too vague. Who gets to determine which particular actions are noble or ignoble? Aristotle's response is twofold. In response to the criticism that this is too vague, his books discuss the different virtues and vices and the kinds of choices they lead to <coughs> as thoroughly as possible, recognizing that particular situations require the exercise of particular virtues and a rational explanation of why a certain choice is best. The theory that someone with a firm and unchangeable character could be trusted most to make the best choice is, uh, in a given situation is vague, and yet this is the way human beings operate for the most part. People disagree on who is wiser, but they still trust the judgments of those who have a reputation for good character and judgment. Certainly, reading and studying Aristotle should not and cannot lead to a blind acceptance of everything he says. One does, does not have to agree with him or with his students' notes on what he said in his lecture. At, rather, Aristotle's work should trigger serious and complex thinking about the nature of virtue and vice. It should inspire everyone to their own model of the best life against which they judge particular people and situations. In response to the criticism that such a model is too idealistic, Aristotle would say it's the only realistic way to discuss human affairs. If citizens are not raised to love virtue and justice and to actually act virtuously and justly, a society will always be unstable. Um, in spite of all the possible disagreements, Let's do a thought experiment and envision what a society would be like if people exercise these virtues. P 
People would eat and drink only the right food for the right reason in the right way. They would get exercise and be naturally healthy. They would die natural deaths and most likely be fairly active and healthy before quickly fading and then dying. People would not engage in premarital sex and would be faithful to their spouses. They would be conscientious parents and raise their children with good habits. They would be generous with time and money and would teach their children to care about other people, including people they do not know. They would have good will toward everyone and follow the golden rule. In relation to courage, they would raise their children to be able to be aggressive when necessary, but would also encourage them to settle disputes peacefully through conversation. They would be willing to fight for their country, but would not seek to go to war for personal glory. They would evaluate whether a military campaign was just or unjust. They would not allow politicians to appeal to fear to manipulate them into going into war. They would have the courage to speak out if they disagreed. In relation to liberality, rational citizens would find out what the greatest talents are, what the society provides in terms of a career, and would match their desires and talents to a career that would provide a middle-class standard of life. If their talents and interests lead to a higher-paying job, such citizens would give the money back in ways that provided opportunity for fellow citizens to achieve middle-class status. As parents, they would pay for their children's needs but not indulge their excess desires. They would do what's necessary for their children to get the best education possible. They would expect their children to be successful according to their natural ability level and would not try to force them to be overachievers or allow them to be underachievers. They would stay informed about public affairs and educate their children to be conscientious about other people. Such a model is not unattainable. It's been attained in various places for very uh, amounts of time throughout history. No one could argue that it's somehow perverse. One might argue about whether it's possible, necessary, or desirable for authoritarian laws and rulers to enforce such behavior. Clearly, it would be much better if the citizens chose to act this way, and you can't force people to do it anyway. True virtue on Aristotle's view cannot be forced. It has to be chosen and chosen for its own sake. Um, all right. What happens when the capabilities are developed but without a model of temperance, current, cur courage, or liberality? The developed na nations provide examples of such cases since citizens living in those nations have had the opportunity to develop their capabilities. The United States over the last half, half century has given the, its citizens more choices than any other nation due to its excess wealth, capitalist economic system, separation of church and state, separation of powers in the Constitution, and relatively low taxes. How has it worked out? Not very well. The failure to develop even the most basic virtues of temperance, courage, and liberality among citizens in the developed country and among the wealthy city, citizens in the developing countries has led to great suffering and injustice in the un underdeveloped nations. If one goes back to the list of capabilities, citizens in a free and open society such as the United States have uh, had the opportunity to develop their capabilities to a high degree. Um, Americans, in the last 50 years, Americans have had the opportunity to live long lives, to be healthy, to travel, to choose their sexual partners, to use their sensations, imaginations, and reason to get education, to choose who to love and care for, to form a conception of the good life and make choices, to affiliate with whoever they want, all of the capabilities on the list. What, what have they done with their opportunity to develop their ca capacities? They've chosen to ruin their health. They don't necessarily want to travel and find out about how other people live. They choose sexual infidelity, they break trust with sexual partners, they use their re imaginations and reason to create sentimental romantic ideas about life, and then they're disappointed when these false hopes are not achieved. They go to college and don't apply themselves. Um, they make friends who corrupt them rather than inspire them. 
They choose to pollute the earth and buy unnecessary goods made of unrecyclable materials. They choose not to vote. They sign contracts for homes they can't pay for. They get wealthy by manipulating uneducated people into signing contracts they will have to break. They use the opportunities they have to get rich and, um, and help their friends get rich or become powerful and help their friends become powerful, even when their friends do not have the talent or desire to use the power or wealth wisely. The failure to develop even the most basic virtues of temperance, courage, and liberality among citizens in the developed countries and among wealthy citizens in the developing countries has led to great suffering. Um, the corruption of pleasure among the wealthy also leads to a corruption of the virtue of courage. Certainly a life is vulnerable, so there's a lot to fear. Those who are intemperate also fear disease and pain and death. Um, our uh, advertisements for medical remedies often appeal to fear. Um, more importantly, fear is applied when deciding whether, when, how, and why to go to war. A nature of a nation of intemperate people is more likely to to exploit other nations for their wealth, or basically create animosity and go to war. Intemperance creates not only a consumer culture but also a military culture. Everybody can figure that out. In a temperance society, citizens would question any leader's interference in other countries. Citizens would not want their rulers to force other nations into unjust trade agreements, um, etc., etc. They would, temperance citizens would want their leaders to be diplomatic, to use diplomatic solutions, to use intelligence so that the diplomacy is not naive, rather than war. Um, Aristotle's work in general uh, works are an excellent starting point for liberal education, reading and assimilating the ideas and arguments in the ethics and politics can make a huge difference in the lives of those who study them. Those who are habituated well from birth will be able to unite their emotions and previous actions dictated to them by authority figures with arguments for why the drive toward human excellence is natural, necessary, and in everyone's best interest. They will make the transition from what Aristotle calls living according to reason, performing rational actions, and acting in a way that's united with right reason. A young person will now know why their authority figures make the demands they make. The young people will now choose to live this way on their own, choose it for its own sake, and choose it consistently developing a strong character. For those whose upbringing is flawed or oriented toward the wrong goals, Aristotle gives compelling arguments for why greed and all the other personal vices lead to personal misery, social decay, and destruction. Students of Aristotle's ethics and politics should be motivated to control their desires by the love of wisdom. A liberal arts education is a crucial part of creating and preserving the virtues in the souls of citizens that must exist for a city to survive and thrive. In his essay, The Aims of Education, Alfred North Whitehead says, quote, in training a child to activity of thought, above all things we must beware of inert ideas, that is to say, ideas that are merely received into the mind without being utilized or tested or thrown into fresh combinations, unquote. Since educators have taught Aristotle's works to many of the best and brightest students for many centuries, one can imagine that his ideas are more often than not taught in a way that makes them inert. This paper has tried to correct for this problem by arguing that uh, Aristotle's work can make a very significant contribution to the development of ideas about the most important subjects leading to the most important policy recommendations throughout the world at this time. Young people today, the future leaders, would benefit greatly from lectures in Aristotle that admittedly pick and choose from his enormous corpus, but do so with the goal of showing the ways Aristotle's insights can shed light on our situation today. And that's, of course, what I'm trying to do here. It is a great tragedy of history that Aristotle's works, especially his politics, 
has been associated with corrupt leaders who believe that they are wiser than those over whom they rule simply because they have power or because they've read Aristotle or because they can give an Aristotelian sounding explanation for how they rule. But we need not and should not throw out the baby with the bathwater. Any book that discusses the nature of justice, truth, and virtue will be used and abused by those who either believe they're truly virtuous and just when they're not, or by cynical leaders who, quote, recognized authorities in order to hide their true natures and intentions. The United States capabilities approach will only be effective when applied by powerful people who have the right desires, the natural intelligence, and the education necessary to actually figure out how to develop the capabilities of citizens in each nation and how to get nations to treat each other justly. The capabilities list does not mention that al although everyone should have a chance to think, imagine, etc., some will excel more than others in the ability to know how to exercise power. Those talented in the exercise of authority should be given more and more opportunities as long as they continue to demonstrate that they have the gift for it. One aspect of this gift is to empower those over whom they exercise authority to develop their souls so that they, in turn, can take over power and exercise it well. A good ruler is a role model. If enough people develop the talent for ruling themselves and others, there will be less need for an authority. A good ruler makes laws that force the rich to stay in the middle class and the poor to work their way into the middle class, or as much as possible, laws can't force people to do anything. The combination of good laws and good habits minimize the need for a powerful ruler to control an unruly public. The more citizens can rule themselves, the less they depend on the eccentricities of even the best rulers and the less vulnerable they are when a good ruler dies or something else happens. Good rulers try to make themselves obsolete by showing and explaining to citizens how to rule themselves and why it would be better for them to do so. Not surprisingly, the conclusion of this paper leads directly to the most important reason for conferences, um, international conferences among scholars going on throughout the world today. Globalization today requires that those who are engaged in the process of economic development also possess the virtues Aristotle discusses and exercises those virtue in a way that will lead to practical wisdom. A complete discussion of the real meaning of the capabilities approach and the place of the United Nations in the globalization process must include an examination of many of the virtues. I would recommend many of the other Aristotelian virtues as also integral parts of the exercise of practical wisdom necessary to apply the capabilities model successfully. But Aristotle's model is not the only one. I've tried to present Aristotle's view in a way that makes it so intuitively obvious and its application so compelling that there are many variations on these themes among philosophers, economists, political philosophers, and other intellectual uh, intellectuals throughout the world. International conferences provide one opportunity for intellectuals to ex ex exercise their own capability for finding models of religion, philosophy, politics, economics, literature, history, science, technology, or any other aspect of culture that will guide globalization toward more just relationships among human beings as fellow citizens and as members of nation states in an increasingly interconnected world. After reading our papers, we should be compelled to establish or support international schools where the rulers from around the world would send their children so they could develop a philosophical perspective on global affairs. Such an education would give them the practical wisdom they need to go back to their countries and rule well. Young people with the natural talent and drive to become future rulers who rule justly should be given the opportunity to develop these capabilities. We need an international meritocracy, a culture that nurtures those who truly want what's best for everyone.
who are educated to be able to move in that direction. Power would be given to those who demonstrate the capacity for statesmanship. Aristotle would approve. <laughs>